everyone, and welcome to a special snazzy suit edition of Mental Health Matters with your host, Dr. Matt Gloviak. I hope all of you are staying well and safe as we're still amidst the middle of the pandemic and everything else that's going on here in the nation. Uh, today, I would like to introduce our special guest, trustee, Michael Carpanzo. Michael, it's great having you here. Thank you for the invite. I'm looking forward to a great discussion. No, absolutely, as am I. Well, would you like to share a little bit about yourself, kind of what you do in the community and so on? Sure. So uh, I was uh, a, a part of this business community for about a decade, maybe almost 12 years now. Uh, actually started off as a banker uh, oh, okay. in the community. And uh, then I was able to uh, get involved with some nonprofits. So uh, my bank manager at the time said, how do you get involved in the community? And they said, well, get involved with some nonprofit organizations. So um, way back when, I was the president of a local Kiwanis club here in Bolingbrook. Um, I was a very young president for Kiwanis. Kiwanis, typically, the average age is a little bit older. Um, and then from there, it honestly just opened up amazing doors. So I met great folks at the uh, chamber. Um, and from there, I was able to actually uh, take over the chamber for a few years as their executive director. So I did that. And then I got a, a great job here at the hospital in town. I do uh, some outpatient physical therapy sales for them. Nice. Um, and all throughout that time, I stayed involved with many uh, civic and nonprofit organizations. Um, and then an opportunity came up, and they said, would you like to be on the ballot? And I said, who would want to do that? <laughs> who would want to do that? But I said, yes. Here you are. <laughs> Excellent. And uh, successful. First, uh, first election. I got elected uh, just about a year and a half ago. Um, and things are moving well. Village has been through a lot of change, but uh, I try to stay in the loop and reach out to residents, businesses, and nonprofits as much as I can. No, absolutely. And I mean, you have quite the resume there and a lot of the things that you've really done on behalf of the community. You know, I, I have to say I absolutely love Bolingbrook. Um, yeah. You know, I've shared earlier, I'm born and raised Bolingbrook, Illinois, lived out here uh, most of my life. You know, during my 20s, I had a little condo out in Yorkville for a bit, but then went to raise my family, moved back here to Bolingbrook, Illinois. And I've just been so pleased with how much this community has grown and just how much it really has to offer to other people. And, you know, I oftentimes find myself in conversations with others who are talking about how great their community is, you know, where they live and things like that. And then I start sharing the things that we're doing out here in Bolingbrook. And literally, you know, so many people are baffled. I mean, the diversity that we have. You know, when I was younger, the one complaint I had is that we didn't have enough restaurants or great sure. diversity of the restaurants. Now, I, you know, I can't say that anymore really great local cuisine and you know my wife and I even get a kick out of it uh, we're really into Mexican food and I was counting I think there's at least 11 12 Mexican That's restaurants cool. out here some of the best I've ever had which is fantastic but also all the other little things that we've been doing in the community here, and you especially, and that's you know the topic of what we're going to be discussing here with community mental health, is just keeping active during times, you know, keeping active all the time. There's always been great things going on every single year, which is why I love this community, but especially during the pandemic. Yeah. You know, so often I'm sitting here and I'm watching the news, doom scrolling through social media, if you will, and you know, I'm seeing all these bad things that are happening in communities and people just at odds with one another. We're seeing riots out in the yeah. street and it's just been really unsettling and disturbing. And, you know, even more than ever, I'm feeling so grateful to be part of a community like this and I go through and I'm taking a look at media and you know my emails and stuff like that there's always some type of new event going on and so many people standing in solidarity pleased proud of this community and you have a big part of that well <laughs> we all have a big part of that and I think True. that's what makes Bolingbrook amazing um, is because when, when there is something going on, um, it's, it's a community affair. It always has been. Um, of course, there's, there's certain leaders out there that have, some have come and gone, some mm -hmm. have stuck around. Um, obviously, I saw that as an opportunity to say, hey, what, what kind of impact do you want to have on your community? Um, some people are perfectly fine with going to work, coming home, having dinner, and going to bed, and that's fine. They're a productive member of society but others choose to sort of be engaged and be involved. Um, and that's really the beauty of, of what Bolingbrook has done. We've always found um, a great uh, camaraderie mm -hmm. of uh, business owners interacting with residents and residents trying to serve people through nonprofit organizations. So that's been really neat. We're 76,000 plus people, um, but really we've always, and I know everyone uh, here and everyone here at the village and everyone in the community always says we're such a you know a small community, even though we're 76,000 plus. You know, and that's one of the things I absolutely love about this community as well is that you know it has grown 
grown substantially over the years. You know, I think when I was a kid growing up, maybe 40, 50,000 okay. people, somewhere like that. You know, and even when I was growing up, we were still talking about Barber's Corners and when this town was incorporated. And just, you know, I remember the four years it went to University of Illinois from 2001 to 2005. You know, I was doing my thing out in Champaign, living at the dorm at the frat house apartment and all that. And I remember, you know, coming back one summer and I saw this huge mall was built right by my sure. house all these new restaurants, all these new activities. We had miniature golf going on, ice cream shops all over the place. And it just, it really grew substantially, but it did so in a way that just really seemed to make sense for everybody. And like you said, you know, although we've gotten a lot larger, we still have that sense of community. You know, I feel like, especially now at a time like this, when we're dealing with the pandemic, civil unrest, and there's a lot of people who are at odds with one another, that sense of community is needed more than ever. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, I, I would I would absolutely echo that because I think what has um, kept us strong during this time is exactly uh, the, the fact that we have something in common, mm -hmm. and that's our love for this community. Um, I, I truly believe that um, the door-to-door -door diversity that we have has uh, spared us from a lot of... Um, of course, there's always nastiness out there. Mm -hmm. You're never going to find there a is. community of not everyone who has you know the perfect gold heart. Oh, However... Absolutely. I think that uh, more so of us living in an environment where it is just the norm and you know our children my children growing up in an environment where you would think nothing else mm -hmm. has really um, kept us away from from some of the nastiness that we've seen um, across the country and I hope that continues so our love for community and our love for each other and our ability to be in a neighborhood a subdivision that is incredibly diverse and unique um, and then all come together and support a local restaurant or support a local business um, I really think that that bonds us together for sure as members of the community no absolutely I mean that's a big part of it. And I think the other piece of it as well is just how proactive, you know, you and the rest of the leaders of this community and everybody else who's been involved have really been with everything. Sure. You know, I'm sitting here and, you know, we have planned peaceful protests going on. I know, you know, there were some concerns and everything with what happened in some of the communities around us. You are kind of worried that would come to Bolingbrook. I remember the promenade, there was going to be a protest and we ended up moving it here to the community center. Yep. Went very well. I, I remember one post after another, after another saying beautiful job, Bolingbrook. Brook. I really love how well this went. Everybody was able to stand there, have their voices heard. And the biggest piece of it all, though, like, is really just how safe it feels. Now, like you said, there's going to be nastiness in any type of community. Sure. And, you know, Bolingbrook's no exception to that. Of course, there are off things that happen. You know, but that sense of safety, being able to walk down the street late at night, being able to go, you know, to the promenade, not worry about anybody taking your goods, being able to have a walk around the community center, just feeling like you're a big part of something. Like, what contributes to that? Wow, uh, that's, a, that's a very loaded question. It's a loaded so, question. I uh, figure you got a good answer. Uh, incredibly proactive on that. So you want to talk about peaceful marches and, and mm -hmm. peaceful protests, um, which is what everyone, I, haven't, I don't think I've met anyone who would be against a peaceful protest. However, um, if you do not have an open dialogue with those organizers and the folks that are going to be a part of that, um, and it's not about uh, restricting or controlling what's going to happen. It's just about knowing what's going to happen. Absolutely. The more that, that folks are on the same page, um, even if some of the language or bullet points are not necessarily in line with maybe your personal values, um, it's just that ability to have that conversation saying, listen, I have X opinion. Um, I'm going to be sharing this opinion, but I'm letting you know this is in the manner that we're going to do it. And then being able to work together on that solution. So um, locally here, working with both village leadership and police department leadership, all of those groups thus far, and I've been to each of those peaceful protests, have been proactive about working with the village and working with the police department to ensure that everyone's on the same page. And I've seen great things, um, even protests that maybe uh, were not all in favor of police, were police officers out there, mm -hmm. you know, knuckling and elbow bumping members of the community, kids in the community that they know, um, because that's the type of environment they have. They respect the fact that you can say what you need to say, but also at the same time, that your, your village and, and your police department's here for you. So um, I really think that we're unique in that. And uh, it, it does not come easy. It sometimes looks like it comes off easy. And there's a lot of folks that work hard to make sure those things go off, hopefully so far without a hitch. Well, so far from everything that I've yes. seen, I mean, it really has looked, you know, quite easy, but we know things are oftentimes easier said than done. You know, but that's one thing I really do appreciate is allowing individuals to be able to have their voice in the community, be able to be heard. And I feel like there's enough diversity in this community where everybody does have a space to be able to speak, a space to be able to feel safe and be represented and so on. And that's one of the beautiful things, you know, about this, you know, 
area. You know, I was talking in a previous episode here, we were discussing Black Lives Matter, and sure. I was saying, you know, growing up in this community, and, you know, okay, the wool was pulled over my eyes, but I almost, I never really understood what racism was because that just didn't really seem like a thing when I was growing up. Or, you know, gang activity, something, again, I didn't really have to worry about. I think one time I saw graffiti sprayed on the school in the morning. By the end of the day, Gone. Like it never even happened. So this community is very reactive to those types of things. And I think that's why, you know, we really have been receiving a lot of recognition from the communities around us statewide, nationally even, you know, just for how well everything is put together. So you walked yourself into the next question. So like you said, there's definitely some challenges and things like that. It doesn't come quite as easy. So I'm wondering what were some of the biggest challenges you've had to face? And maybe specific to things starting, let's say maybe mid-March or so with COVID-19 and you know onward sure so uh, the obviously that the first uh, sector that was hit hardest was that restaurant hospitality sector Absolutely. so that was obviously where a lot of congregation happened as soon as um, um, COVID really started uh, to become an issue here in the state um, so they were the first to get shut down and I cannot tell you uh, the amount of business owners that reached out and said I don't know what to do you know mm -hmm. and, uh, Susie our waitress has a family of three she worked here every single night, you know, made tips, and this was her living. What are we going to do? So we kept on hearing those messages, um, and we heard them a lot, and everyone had, well, we got to help them. We got to help them. <laughs> what, what do we do? Everything's shut down. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, money was tight, even a, as a village. You know, there was a spending freeze. Um, so we did something as simple as a social media page. Um, we just started a social media group, and it was called Eaton Bolingbrook. And my goodness, was that... Um, just an eye-opener, both for residents and business owners to say, wow, I didn't know that this little taco stand existed. Um, I didn't know that they had this special on Fridays. Um, and especially during that time when you, you couldn't eat outdoors, which we have taken a, a dip back where that's happening yes. again. Um, and just being able to find out, you know, who's delivering and, and what, what kind of food's out there. And I have a taste for Chinese food and where do I get it? Um, that was really a, just a simple concept um, that just exploded, um, and the community really warmed up to it. Obviously, it's serving uh, the, the one subset that is on social media, but now, nowadays, there's quite a few people on social well, media. Well, absolutely. You know, when something is simple, and I don't want to say it's simple, like I'm not trying to minimize it at no. all, but, you know, thinking about restaurants and our local businesses, you know, it's been a huge blow to people, this whole social distancing thing. And, you know, we try to say, okay, it's not necessarily social distancing, but physical distancing, wear your mask six feet yep. apart, all that good stuff. But we want people to still be able to relate to one another, people to still communicate with one another, because we know, you know, when people start to isolate, they're not around other people, what happens? You start feeling lonely, you become depressed, negative thoughts are perseverating in your head, and you just start to feel completely detached, and especially individuals with diagnosable mental health disorders, substance use disorders, and so on, you know, really the ground starts to fall out uh, beneath them. And I think that that was one of the very miraculous things, too, that Bolingbroke really did with the local restaurants and that. You know, I remember I was, started, you know, eating Bolingbroke yeah. on Facebook. Okay, so eating Bolingbroke. I remember <laughs> my wife was the one, uh, Megan, who actually discovered it. She's like, wow, there's this, you know, Know, Eaton Bolingbrook social media page. Like, did you even know some of these restaurants existed? And you know, I'm seeing hundreds. Like at first, I saw 40, 50 people in the group. Then over 800. Now I think there's thousands of yeah. people who are 4, involved 000, in this group. There you go, yeah. 4,000. You know, so growing large. And the thought in my head is, how are these newer establishments going to be able to survive? And I was really, you know, concerned. You know, like about the, like Danny's Pizza that opened literally the week all the COVID-19 <laughs> restrictions went down. I'll never forget that right by me. Or a new place, you know, Taqueria de Valle you know, like opening up in the middle of this, and now things are shutting down again, and all the other restaurants I haven't named. And I was just wondering, how are they going to do it? But it feels like through that sense of community and the action that was put into this, went off without a hitch. You know, I'm still seeing ribbon cutting ceremonies, <laughs> places are having specials, you know, but doing it the right way, which is absolutely amazing. Well, I think, I mean, obviously everyone learned a whole bunch. I mean, I can't imagine how many people I think have learned really how to wash their hands throughout all this. Um, but again, the ability to sort of have a sense of community when community was tough to be a part of, that was really what was neat. So even if it was just taking a picture of your pizza from Danny's mm -hmm. um, and talking about it and having people say, oh yeah, you know, I got this or I got that special. Did you try the egg rolls? Um, people That's felt amazing. a part of something when they literally, I mean, in some cases weren't working were at home with their families, with doors shut, and couldn't see anyone. This was, you know, just an avenue, um, a positive avenue of talking about things. Because obviously, as we mentioned before, there's plenty of doom and gloom out there that you can spend hours or days um, looking at. But this was a really neat kind of hyper-local way to say, what's our way to be 
be a part of this community? Because the, the first thing that we hear when there's an empty, you know, a restaurant goes out of business or there's an empty storefront is what happened? Mm -hmm. Well, these places don't leave because they want to leave. They leave because something happened. We didn't support them. The community didn't support them in some way. Um, maybe it was a product that wasn't needed, but also maybe we just went elsewhere. Maybe we drove across the state to go to a different mall, or maybe we went to a restaurant out of town because we wanted to, and that's all fine. My wife even gets packages from Amazon. However, it's all within reason, mm -hmm. knowing that with every decision that we make, there's a, probably a reaction to that, and some of it's going to affect your local community. So just this really brought, and it was nationally, we understood what needs to be made here. Maybe we should make some ventilators here in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, here in Bolingbroke, it was, hey, if we want to save this business, save this restaurant, maybe we should support them. And how, how can we support them so they stay and so we have them as, as a, a benefit and amenity of the community? And I think that hopefully has taught some folks the importance of, of this community and shopping local and, and kind of all those messages. Absolutely. So we've kept, you know, we've kept the economy, you know, the economy is still thriving despite everything that's going on here. You know, we have people who have somewhere to be able to go, you know, and even if they're uncomfortable eating, dining al fresco or carrying sure. out stuff like that, they can get the delivery, have a good meal at home with their family. It's a lot of really great things, you know, and kind of want to divert the attention a little bit now in this direction is as you were talking about two, you know, businesses going out of business. We also have a lot of people people, you know, who have lost their jobs or have had hours cut back. You know, a lot of families who are, you know, working, you know, full time and now their children, especially with schools about to start and everything, whether they're going face to face, hybrid online, what have you, what do I do with my kids and all this type of stuff that's going on right now? Very stressful for anybody and that puts a big, you know, damper on, you know, trying to move forward with everything that's going on. But time and time again now, I'm seeing all sorts of different programs in the community, like free meals for children uh, yeah. throughout the week and, you know, all these like little types of activities and stuff going on. Like, how, how did all that come to be? Do you have your hand in any of the free meals for kids or? So I, I should probably give this asterisk. Um, I try to maybe by, by fault. Um, try to over communicate sometimes because I think one of our um, weaknesses as as a society is that while there is a lot of methods of communication, mm -hmm. um, there's not one central method of communication anymore. It's not just uh, definitely not physical newspapers anymore. It's definitely not what you see on the television because that's not overly local, except for of course our friends here at BCT. Well, BCT. Um, so there's really no one central uh, way. You know, social media is again it, it serves one subset, but not all subsets. So um, communication in general is something that I have tried to take a, a personal passion in and over communicating. So I also try, I tried to hub together, um, obviously when food resources were a little bit scarce and even just opportunities for volunteering were scarce, mm -hmm. um, I threw together um, just a, a central list of food resources. We have so many different government and non-governmental agencies that are helping with this, nonprofits, churches, um, but no one was necessarily communicating with each other. Everyone was sort of siloed. So we found that as an opportunity because people wanted to know where can my kids go, one, to volunteer, and two, if I am struggling and I need food, where can I go to get food for my family? Um, and there really wasn't a central resource, so we started that as well. And that's up, uh, up on a landing page now, too, so it's easily found. Um, all the township resources and the church resources all in one page. Um, people use that, again, for two reasons. One, to, if they need food, and two, if they need to serve and give back, how can they do that? So we did that as well. Um, there's no shortage of opportunities to help. The biggest issue we have is reaching out. So mm -hmm. if I were to encourage one thing would be uh, reach out if you need assistance or reach out if you want to help, if you want to be involved. Um, this doesn't have to be uh, Mike Carpenzano putting it up on a website. It could be anyone if you see that there's a need. Those, those ideas are so welcomed, and, and I hope that people are encouraged to share that and, and be involved in community. That's an important thought, too. You know, I oftentimes I'll be sitting with clients, speaking to my students. I'm like, well, how great is an idea if nobody knows about Correct. it? You can have the most genius idea in the world, but if nobody knows about it, well, then is it really that great of an idea? You know, and I think that's a big part of the problem, like you said, as well, by not having any type of communication. You know, one organization might be giving bottles of water. Another organization might be giving those little lunchable snacks for kids. Another organization is giving hand sanitizer. Another's giving toilet paper. 
paper. You know, so you're going to all these different places, you're not even hearing about them at all. You know, but having that communication is ever so important, and that's where you know the over communication really is important. You know, how many different social media groups do we have for Bowling Brook right. on Facebook or you know Twitter? Like there's so <laughs> many different ones going on, but I'll always see them posted all over the place. Or we'll have the community board go on the Village of Bowling Brook website. You can see all the stuff right there. You know, which is really great. Well, what do you think for individuals who might be watching the show who are wondering, even still, okay, well, you know, I'm not on Facebook, so I'm not involved in any of these posts or anything. I'm not really a social media person. I don't really read the paper. How might they get filled in on the stuff that's going on out here? Sure. So, um, and and this, this has become a challenge. So on the uh, newspaper side of things, um, it, and there's uh, people will have their opinions on the patch, but there is some uh, ways to self-post. So a lot of our organizations do self-post on the patch. So regardless of what you may think about their editorial style, um, there is ways to view that community calendar. Um, but frankly, picking up the phone, calling the Chamber of Commerce, calling the village itself, um, everyone here that's upstairs in this building has a true passion for community as well. And they will answer that question. So um, if you do not have access to any of those digital means, um, literally picking up the phone and calling a resource like the township, like the village, um, like the Chamber of Commerce. Those are great resources to go to, um, and they may direct you to uh, someone, an elected official, a community leader, um, a, a pastor, but they're going to find a way to connect you with whatever resource that is. I've never directed anyone to call any of those organizations, and they did not find them that answer. Maybe they didn't have it themselves, but they found them that answer. So please um, communicate, ask, and then Give feedback. How do you want to hear from things? Um, so if you have a particular method that is that works for you, please let us know. It may not uh, be instituted immediately, but we'll find a way to, to make that happen. Hey, everything good takes time. Sure, of course. Everything good takes time. <laughs> you know, and I know that not everybody's going to agree with everything all the time, and there are exceptions to everything. But one thing that one of many things, you know, it can go on forever. You know, I'm very pleased with this community. It's just how responsive it really is. You know, even what was it, a week ago with the storm, you know, and the trees got yeah. knocked down and everything, immediately the public works is out there picking things up. Again, like we talked about the protest, okay, kind of worried, let's move it over here into a safer area. You know, being proactive, business businesses are opening up, so let's try to promote them as much as possible. You know, having stuff for the kids, all these different things that we've got going on. Great, 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 great. So I'm wondering, like on your end, you know, being involved, um, you know, as a trustee with the community, what do you think are some potential opportunities or needs? Like if you were to request something, you know, to people watching this in the community, you might be interested in getting involved. Like where is the need at this time? Wow. Um, so, uh, and I, I've watched a few of your previous episodes. So on the uh, youth interaction side, so mm -hmm. with the way that COVID-19 has impacted uh, young children and the ability for them to uh, move outside the house and talk to other uh, kids their age, um, they also have not been exposed to positive role models, obviously beyond what's in their, hopefully in their household. Mm -hmm. um, so there are still organizations, even digitally and virtually, that are encouraging um, mentorship and tutoring and just finding those positive role models in, in their lives. So uh, I would encourage, if you do have a passion for uh, youth, there is definitely an opportunity. There's several nonprofits. I don't want to get into naming too many, but mm -hmm. uh, DoCap here in town is a great one. H2O, Heart Haven Outreach, is a fantastic organization um, that still does mentoring. Um, there's a heart program here that's, that still operates out of the community center. So there's several organizations that need those positive, um, preferably adult role models in their lives. They usually have access to other kids, uh, but we do lack those kind of good role models in town. If you're just a financial advisor in town, if you're um, if you just work a nine to five job in an office, it doesn't matter. Um, we need people with good values and, and, and good hearts to say, hey, I'd love to be paired up um, with the youth in our community to guide them on a good path. I think that's probably the largest need right now. On the senior end, I would love to say there's a need there, and there is. Mm -hmm. It is so incredible. There's so many barriers to helping them right now because of the current pandemic, um, and getting them uh, virtually involved has been a challenge. So I think we will eventually master that, um, but right now it's been very difficult to work with that older population. I think that is a need, but definitely the, the younger population needs those role models right now. No, absolutely. Well, and especially with working with the older population, concerns with COVID-19, worrying that you might catch it or you might give it to them, and so a really sensitive topic right sure. there. However, I have seen a lot of different programs, um, you know, as far as like Meals on Wheels, looking for some additional yeah, people. Hey, exactly. you know, if you got a car, you got some time, here, help drop off 
some meals or come, you know, maybe, you know, like play the guitar, sing some songs, entertain the group and so on. And like you said, with the younger populations, ever so important. You know, and it is very sad what they're having to go through right now. Because we keep in mind, you know, our youth, they don't have the coping skills that most of us have as adults. You know, for a lot of them, it's really scary or very confusing right now. You know, the kids, they want to go outside, they want to play, they want to have fun. You know, we have a class of high schoolers who didn't, you know, get to have a regular type of graduation and now they're not getting to go off to college. I mean, that's a very painful type situation, not getting to go, you know, hang out at the park or, you know, I was supposed to be, I was, was going to be a t-ball coach for the first time. I signed up as an assistant coach, like, oh, well, we need a head coach. And I told him, I was like, well, is it a problem? I can't catch or throw a ball to save my life. They're like, you're working with four-year-olds. It's okay. Get involved. But so many different types of opportunities like that. And you and my little guy at home, we were doing some, you know, Zoom meetings with the Stepping Stones preschool and that. He was just, you know, he started crying after. It's like, I really want to see my friends. I wish I could be with them. Like, this is this is really hard. And, you know, we try to explain it to him as best as possible. He knows there's a sickness out there. He knows his loved ones are coming in, you know, to see him and that. But it, it is really hard. And we can't, you know, underestimate everything that's going on. But even as being adults here, you know, like in our age group and so on, you know, carrying a lot of brunt of trying to stand strong through all of this, trying to keep our nose to the grind. Now we're taking on additional responsibilities of caring for our kids, caring for the seniors in our lives, our grandparents, our parents, and so on. And it, it really is a lot. So not enough can be said about the importance of community because when you have a community, again, that's proactive, you have that sense of togetherness, it's diverse, it feels safe, and everybody's working together and on the same page, you know, a really great place to live. And, you know, my Bolingbroke, a place to grow. I mean, it really is, you know, kind of going back to the children, though, they're missing out on a lot of those opportunities that, you know, I had growing up, you know, to get to the point to where I am here today. And, you know, we really do need to focus focus on that as well. But you know, from what I've seen, there's been a lot of great stuff that's going on. I do encourage you know, those of you who want to get involved to do so. So many ways to do it, and you don't even necessarily have to be face-to-face -face with others. Sure. You can do things virtually. Well, how about in our last couple of minutes here, any additional thoughts you have on the topic? Anything that's been on your mind at all? Wow. Uh, I, I think we've, we've talked about a lot. Um, but if anything really sparked an interest, and I would encourage anyone who's watching, um, please don't hesitate. It's not going to be awkward if you reach out and say, hey, I sort of want to be involved, but what does that mean? Is it going to take me away from my job? What about my kids? Um, I would say if, if you have a passion for something, whether it's uh, two hours a month or two hours a week, um, we can find an opportunity for you to help out. If it's environment that you're passionate about, if it's children and youth, um, if it's supporting small businesses, um, there's so many ample opportunities for you to be involved. So just reach out. I think that's the best way. That's the best message that I always have is be engaged, be informed, see what's happening around you, and then love it and learn it. You know, when you're out there and you're uh, having a meal, uh, give kudos to that restaurant. It's going to make an impact on someone else. If you're out there and you see something that needs to be, you know, there's a crack in the sidewalk and you tripped over it, say something. It's okay to say something. Maybe don't do everything on Facebook, but it's okay to pick up the phone and say, hey, I have, I have a concern here. So just uh, have an open communication with those community leaders, those elected officials, those uh, church and faith leaders. Just have those open dialogues with folks. That would be my one encouragement. No, oh, absolutely. You made an important point because I do believe that a lot of people want to volunteer. They want to put their best foot forward and have all these great ideas. But the big concern is how am I going to stack that on top of everything Correct. else I've got going on? There's only so many hours in a day, days in a week, and so on. But like you said, whether it's one hour a week, two hours a month, what have you, every little bit can go a very long way. You know what, Michael, thank you very much for being a guest here on the show. And for those of you watching, we have another episode that's going to be coming up next where we're going to talk about keeping sane with an insane schedule. As you can hear, we've got a lot that's going on. So we're going to definitely highlight some of those points here in our uh, next episode. So thank you very much for watching. Uh, please feel free to visit Mental Health Matters on uh, Facebook or feel free to visit our new website, www.mentalhealthmattersshow.com. Um, if, if you would like to send me an email, if you have any questions, comments, or would like to be a guest on the show, email me directly at dr.mgloviak at gmail.com. Again, thank you for watching. Stay well and safe.